So uh, you're very welcome uh, to Grace Hall. Um, to hear the results of our dig from uh, last year, last summer, which uh, seems a long time ago, ago now, but um, it's great to see such, such, a, such a fantastic uh, turnout. Um, I was sort of trying to think about what to say as an introduction, and then uh, a friend just said, well, just tell, them, tell people about how this all sort of came about. So um, I was trying to think, well, how did this all come about? And I suppose I was sort of firstly have to say, we wouldn't be here at all if it wasn't for uh, the landowners, uh, uh, Fanula, and uh, her father, and their family for keeping the name Kilimahomug alive, this curious name, um, which has really brought us all here today. Um, and I also have to say a big thank you as well to Dr. Frank McCory. Uh, Frank's not here, but Frank also picked up on the potential importance of uh, the name, uh, which means uh, Church of My Little Coleman. And of course, there was a tradition in the field of a uh, church and a graveyard. Um, and also uh, the late Kieran Clendenning. Uh, Kieran uh, wrote an article in the Lurgan Mail, and I still remember, uh, I used to work in the Craigavon Museum, and there was a box full of uh, newspaper cuttings um, that Kieran had written for the Lurgan Mail over the years regarding the history of the town. And I still remember opening, or opening the box and pulling out this newspaper cutting that had a, you know, a couple of paragraphs about this Kilmahull mug. And uh, the detail always stuck in my head was, um, Karen had written that when the railway line was built, which uh, cross, crosses the field, that uh, it resulted in the graveyard falling out of use. And the last burial was uh, the coffin had to be carried over the railway embankment. And it was always that detail, the coffin being carried over the railway embankment. I could never quite I can never quite visualize that. And it's only when you go to the field and you see how big the embankment is that you go, okay, I can see why that might be a, be a problem. But it's really thanks to uh, the McConville family, it's thanks to Frank and it's thanks to Kieran uh, for putting that in the, the public domain that we're here at all. So I suppose that's, you know, uh, why we're here at all. In terms of how the dig sort of got started, um, I'd love to say it was something that was plan, but it was sort of a series of coincidences. Um, in 2022, we were, um, I was on a tour of the uh, Daher uh, graveyard uh, by our member uh, Jim uh, Conway. And on that tour, uh, at the end of it, um, I got talking to Fanula, and uh, Fanula happened to mention that uh, she, she, was, she was the owner of uh, Kilmahulmug. And I knew Fanula, but I didn't, I never actually realized she owned the field. And I was really fortunate because at that time, uh, the Historic Environment Division had uh, given us a grant to carry out a ground penetrating radar survey in a uh, Shankill graveyard in uh, Lurgan. Uh, we were looking for uh, famine, famine graves. And uh, that was uh, being carried out by um, uh, Dr. Alistair Raphael and uh, Lisa White and uh, Lauren Carberry O'Neill from Queen's University. And I sort of thought, well, I might be a bit cheeky here and say when they're doing that, would the mine coming over to Kilmahol Mug and to see, you know, if, if there's anything beneath the ground? And Alistair and his team luckily said yes, and uh, HCD were happy. So they went, they'd done their ground radar, and uh, lo and behold, they find a feature of potential. And this is a, a word I've come to realize that archaeology use quite a lot potential, uh, of, a, a feature of potential archaeological significance. And uh, that really gave us a hook to go and do um, a dig, an archaeological dig. And uh, I have to thank the Armagh City Bamber Cravenborough Council, uh, the tourism department, who gave us a bit of money in 2022 to carry out a test dig, um, which was held over five days. And uh, we went out to find a company, and uh, we came across the Northern Archaeological um, Consultancy. And they were super enthusiastic about carrying out uh, this dig to see what this feature was. And uh, we've got Stuart and Katie with us. They were our site directors for that dig, uh, as well as the site directors for uh, the dig we held last year. And uh, it was Stuart and Katie who really said to me, well, rather than just them coming out into the field and digging about, why not open it up to the community um, and get the community involved to see what interest there was. And uh, there was a little bit in the back of my mind always being the pessimist saying, well, if, they don't, if people don't find anything, it might be a terrible disappointment to people. Um, but, you know, they convinced me, no, let's do it as a community dig. And then we had a phenomenal response uh, to that. And um, through that dig, we also 
um, found that this was actually an archaeological feature and that there was enough evidence to suggest this Kilmachal Mug was actually an early medieval site. Not a, we couldn't say it was a church or secular, but it was certainly a site of some description. So it sort of validated that community knowledge that had been preserved by the McConvilles and had been picked up on by Frank and uh, Kieran um, as well. So when, uh, at the end of that, we sat down with uh, Stuart and Katie and I said, well, what's the next steps? And then they came up, well, a three-week community dig to find out more about the site. That would be the, that, that would be the way forward. And um, that was fine, but of course, we needed to find funding for that. And I have to pay, uh, I'll give special thanks to the Craigavon Historical Society, which um, I should have said I'm the secretary, uh, and the secretary of the Craigavon Historical Society, but I approached the, the committee um, about would they support um, us uh, submitting an application to the National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, for a project um, to allow us to carry out this community dig, and they were very supportive. It was a way for the historical society to maybe add something, um, uh, sort of a new string to her bow, as it were. Um, we've never carried out an archaeological excavation before, and it was maybe a way of uh, getting people enthused about local history and giving them an opportunity to get hands-on with it. Um, so, so thank you very much, particularly to our treasurer, John Bustard, because um, you know, his workload's increased um, quite a lot since we, got, since we got the grant. So thank you, John, for helping, um, helping administer it. Um, so National Lottery Heritage Fund, they um, grant gave us the money to carry out the three-week uh, dig. And uh, I have their banner up here. Um, so thanks to National Lottery players. And I have to say, I really mean that, because really without that funding, you know, we, we couldn't have carried out uh, that dig. Now, the lottery do send their apologies. Uh, we've picked the one day in the year when they can't actually send anybody because it's a regional, it's a regional conference. Um, but it would be remiss of me not, not to pay, pay tribute to them. Uh, in particular, uh, Jacqueline Rose, who's our project officer, um, uh, Sharon Archer, and uh, Catherine Cochran. Um, they've been really supportive. Any changes um, that we've needed to make, they've been very supportive. And not only that, they're enthused. They really get this project and they really get the value of it, both from a, a research point of view, but also from a community point of view. And uh, yeah, just, just a huge, huge thank you to, to, to the lottery you know, for funding this project. Um, so that was fine. We got word in June, and then we had around about two weeks to organize the whole thing. And uh, I was going, well, is that going to be possible? Uh, luckily, uh, Stuart and Katie and the guys of the Northern Archaeological Society had been working with the HCD, got us our license, which was great. Um, they also, as well as Stuart and Katie, we got, the, the, the got uh, Mario and Marez uh, to join the team. So we had four archaeologists. And uh, the only thing we needed really were volunteers. And uh, in the application to the lottery, I'd sort of said, well, you know, there's real local enthusiasm. We're going to have loads of volunteers. And I was sort of thinking, God, I hope people, uh, I hope people respond to this. Otherwise, they're going to look a bit silly here, <laughs> here, to, here to the lottery. But there was a huge response. And it's great to see so many of you here, here today. I think um, over the course of the three weeks, there were around 450 volunteer opportunities availed of. Um, and uh, we had people from the dig from the first year, uh, with people from, and then new people uh, coming to join us. And it was also great to make connections with Lurgan Model Primary School and St. Teresa's Primary School, who sent their, their P7 classes down, and also from uh, People First, who sent uh, a number of their uh, students down from the Port of Dine and Lurgan branches. And uh, the feedback was, was, was really, really, was really, really good. And it was, it was great just to make, make those new connections. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all the volunteers. Um, this really is a community project. This is a, it's a proper archaeological research excavation, but it's really all about getting people involved. And uh, today we're going to be uh, seeing the results of your work. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our site uh, archaeologists, uh, Stuart and Katie, who are going to sort of let us know what was found and what they think this site is and what the next steps are going to be. So um, I'm going to hand over to you guys if you're happy enough taking over. Thank you. No. There we go. It's good to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming. 
So before we sort of start straight into Kill McCollum Oog, I'm just going to give you a wee bit of a recap from what Stuart did la the last year in the, in the talk, just about the human occupation here on our island. So this is um, a map to show the spread of modern humans. So as you can see here, a lot of the rest of the world is occupied well before we are. So we're only occupied from about 10,000 years ago. And there's one main reason of that, and that's because of this. Uh, an ice sheet that covered our island. So when that started to retreat, uh, it starts to scarp the landscape and leave this nice orange glacial till, which you all know because you're all there digging it out when we were uh, in Lurgan. So um, we find the archeology span in this till uh, and really what we're seeing here in these trenches, so this one at the corner here is, has no archeology span in it, it's just our glacial till. And this one with the flags in it is some archaeology found here. So the differences in the soil here is what we're looking for and is what you guys got to see at um, Kilmacollum Oog. So really, whenever we're digging out archaeology, it's the shadows of our past. And it's really important um, that we get to do this kind of work and show what's here on our island. So this is an example of what um, a Neolithic village would have looked like uh, from an artist's interpretation. And then this is what we see as archaeologists in the ground. So it's just to give you a comparison of a different site compared to what we find in things in Lurgan as well. But the one important thing that we all have in Lurgan that we all got to find was artifacts. And that's one big thing that's left behind once we are digging out our archaeology. Things like flint, pottery and stone all preserve in our soil. And that gives us a really big insight into what's happening in the past. So from our excavations so far in Kilmacollum Oog, we can tell that there is evidence for Neolithic archaeology, Bronze Age archaeology, and early Christian or early medieval archaeology. So this has been identified through subsoil cup features, which is what we dug out, artifacts, and also radiocarbon dating that we got to do this year, which we didn't get to do in our first year. So this was very exciting for us as well. So this is our site plan as of this year. So in total across the field, we've done 15 trenches. So we as David said, we started with one week, very, very minimal. So we've definitely expanded out from the first year, which is great. So all these trenches were put in through geophysical survey done by Al, or also through extensions of trenches from the first year that we found things. So there's a, just a nice overview of our second year. You probably recognize some people in there too. Uh, so one of the things we're going to talk about, say, about artifacts is that we can see on this LIDAR here, there's loads of lines that run up and down here. And these are lazy beds. And in many fields in our island, we have these. And these are what they would have looked like when they were being dug out. But this produces quite a lot of artifacts. So it does. So within our dig so far, we've had a lot of 17th to 20th century pottery. So this is a whole range here, which is all detailed in the report if you wish to fall asleep. Um, it wouldn't be my type of thing, but you know, everybody has their own thing. Uh, so there is a full pottery report in the, that too, which everybody will have access to. So you can read more into this if you like as well. But this kind of stuff, a lot of people might recognize it from maybe in your granny's house, things like that. People still have it today. So we do find it quite often. As archaeologists, Stuart and I'll tell you, like digging topsoil, most places you'll get this kind of stuff. So we're going to have a look at some of our trenches from the first year. Uh, because actually, as we went through, um, we got a lot more different ideas from the first year than we did uh, for, uh, going into the second year. So trench three, trench nine and 10, and trench 12, we think are possible collapsed bank. So a lot of you obviously dug out a lot of stones or dug around a lot of stones, and we wanted you to present them so we could take some photographs. So this actually is very, very important. Um, so that's what we think at the moment those, those sort of represent. So this is trend six that was found. I think we dug this on the last day of the first year, and we find this. So this is what we call a subsoil cut feature. So as you can see, that's your glacial till, and this is the color change that we're looking for and um, that we want to test. So when we did that, we did get uh, sort of a lot of sodomine ware pottery out of it. So already we were like, okay, this is pretty, pretty good. Like, but we were kind of like going into the second year. We want to know what this is. Is it a pit? Is it a ditch? What is it? So we made it a lot bigger, which is basically was the best thing we ever did, I think, <laughs> so far. So as you can see here, we've got the big, this is now from the small trench, from that has become this. 
and your glacial till and your stones out round it. So this is a nice pre-ex plan of it. So obviously we extend that out, so that became trend seven in the second year. Uh, even as we were digging it out, we were getting a wee bit of sort of room wear and stuff from the top. And then we got Joel to dig it out. So Stuart and I did very minimal, minimal digging, to be fair, you guys did it all. So this is what it ended up, like this really big, deep, possible ditch, we think, in here, as, as David said, potential, uh, potential ditch. Um, and with loads of loads of artifacts came out of it, and we also were able to do radiocarbon ditting, which was great, because the first year we didn't get to do that. So we dug it out, we recorded it, everybody got to do some of that, we recovered the artifacts, and we took a sample which the sampling is a very big thing in archaeology. We can tie a lot together with the artifacts, but really the radiocarbon dating, our scientific th stuff, is really, really good and helps us understand the artifacts in which we have. So we did some radiocarbon dates from this darker line fill here, giving us a date of 378 to 537 AD. So that is very, very early medieval in date. So that's really, really amazing to have that. So. Although we have a date, we have one section. What is it? Uh, we think it's a terminus of a ditch, and we possibly think this is the line of it here. So this would have been a start here and come all the way around here. So it looks nice, to be fair. Hopefully, there'll be more of it. Trench 13 also had, this was in the second year, had um, a small gully in it. So again, you've got your subsoil cut feature in here slightly darker, and your glacial till out round. Um, we didn't do any radiocarbon dating from this here, but we did have a lot of sit and rainwear pottery from it. And given its location very close to Trench 7, we are presuming it's definitely early medieval as well. So that's just a little plan done by our volunteer student, Sydney. So I'll give her a wee shout out too. Um, so that's it there, just ending there and coming out. So it probably goes towards Trench 7 as well. Um, so it would be good to get some more information on that too, hopefully. So this trench 14 was up the hill. We did this, I think, in the last week as well. So obviously all the things always happen, like the last week, the most exciting things always happen. So we have in here, is a post hole here, and a post hole here. They are a lot lighter than the, the other ones, but they are there, and a wall slot possibly in here. It's sort of slightly better there looking on the plan. But again, we were able to do another radiocarbon date, which was really good. So we got a date here of 595 to 656, which is slightly later. So you might have the enclosure and then a slightly later structure just above it. Um, but we would need to do more work in here and definitely do more radiocarbon date, open it out a lot more to see exactly what type of structure this could be. Um, but again, very, very exciting. We didn't expect that at all. So. Every, every digging all these things is good, and me telling you about the science bit is great, but really, we all love artifacts. Like, we still love them every day, too, and that's why we want to dig. We want to dig to find stuff. So we have some prehistoric pottery throughout the site. That's what I was saying. We have evidence of Neolithic. We have evidence of Bronze Age archaeology because of things like the pottery, and also we have uh, some flint work as well. So we have some nice scrapers up the top there, and we have a reworked polished stone axe here, too. And as you can see in the corner here as well, in season one we did, we had quite limited prehistoric lithics, but in season two it really started to ramp up. So we, this is evidence that there definitely is prehistoric activity here. You can't have that much stuff and nothing. Just because we haven't found it in 15 trenches doesn't mean that it's not there. So. The other big thing is the, the pottery. As you all probably were there, everybody probably found a bit of pottery because I've never seen so much sort of rainwater pottery come off a site. Uh, we've dug some wraths and things like that. Stuart recently done a wrath. I don't think we've ever had that much from any of those kinds of sites, which it would be more likely to have. So we had loads and loads of it, which was really, really good. And this is very interesting here. I think these pieces are here. Mario has laid them out over there as well, if anybody wants to have a look at them after. So we see up the top here, it's all sort of like, darker than this side. So that's soot marks uh, from it being used as cookware. So those kind of things are really important information that we get from the artifacts. So that tells us that people were using them for their day-to-day -day life um, and using them for cooking. And this is what a reconstruction of what they would have looked like originally. So they're quite sort of bucket shaped. They're not, they're a bit bulky. They're not, you know, fine china or anything. So they are just used for normal stuff, everybody's day-to-day. 
Another big thing we had, we, did, we had a little bit of it in the first year, but a massive amount that came out in the second year was the iron slag. And this was definitely something that we weren't expecting, um, the amount of it we weren't expecting. And we do think that there has to be some sort of metal working here. These all have been, some of these pieces here have been identified as furnace bases or hearth cake. So these would be at the bottom of the, of the furnaces. So there definitely has to be metal working at the site. So this is just an example of what metal working possibly would have taken on here. And this kind of material here is what we're finding. So hopefully, uh, if, we, if we get to do some more ex uh, ex excavation, we would be able to maybe find some of these. That would be a really good indication of what possibly is going on here at the site. Just the amount of iron slag. Obviously, this was a big, big find, was our ingot mould, was great. Um, so we did actually get this um, looked at as well to see if there was any residue. It went to Queen's um, and they had a wee look at to see if there was any residue in, in the mould here to see if we could find out any more information about if there was any, what type of metal was used. Unfortunately, they couldn't get anything from it, but you know, it was worth a try. So it was. And this is just an example of one now, obviously, this is at uh, Clonmacnoise, which is a monastic site, but we just wanted to show you what they do look like in other sites as well. So, you know, we're doing pretty well. Like, it looks pretty good. It's better Nick, at least it's whole. <laughs> so, you know, so it's just to give you an example that there is, they, they, they do exist out there. So hopefully, you know, that's it's, it's very exciting to have to have something like that, it's quite similar. The other thing we had was a honestone for sharpening blades. So we've got the nice cookware, we've got the iron slag, we've got the ingot mold. So we have got a working site here. It's not just somewhere where people live. So that's really exciting to have stuff like that that people are clearly working in the landscape. We had our lovely uh, lignite or shale bracelet, which again, I like the pottery and I like the, you know, the iron slag and things like that, but I think these kind of artifacts are really, really nice. And they're personal to somebody. Somebody was wearing this at the site and all those things. And I think that is so nice to have something like that, that that was actually part of somebody. And we also had a lovely early medieval blue glass bead, which I believe was found by a small child. Yes, <laughs> I think at the open day, possibly. I can't remember, but to be fair, at least we got it. <laughs> so, uh, so that was really nice too to have. Again, very, very small, but it probably would have been on something like this. Um, I think any time I've ever found blue glass beads, to be honest, they've always been like that. I've never actually found a necklace or a bracelet, which is unfortunate, but you never know. So I'm going to move over to Stuart, and he's going to take us through the next bit. Thank you very much. Can every, everybody hear me? Yep. So that blue glass bead was found by a small child because they're closer to the ground, so they are than me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm very much enjoying this, Mike. Uh, Katie and I went to see Dr. Alice Roberts, so I feel very like her at the minute. It's all tacked up. So, um, so I'm just going to take you through a wee bit here. So, so from what Katie's told you, so so what we know, there's there's some sort of prehistoric, prehistoric activity on that site, but we still don't really know what it is. We don't have any subsoil cut features um, of Bronze Age houses or anything like that there, but the amount of flint, the, the, the scrapers for, for preparing animal hides and the axe and stuff like that, there's something prehistoric going on in there, but we can't see it at the minute because our trenches are so small in such a big site. And we have a, a possible ditch that's cut some time between uh, 378 and 537 now. The date that we got from that ditch, the radiocarbon date, came from animal bone in the middle fill. So that fill, that middle fill, dates to 378, three, 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 or 537. But it could have been cut even earlier, even earlier in the AD 300s, something even further back. And then we have a post hole that's dated to 595 to 656, a couple of hundred years later. So at least the site appears to be in use for a couple of hundred years. There's people there for a couple of hundred years. We've got lots of artifacts. They're all typical of the early medieval period, blue glass beads, early medieval, lignite bracelets, and all that suturing where, And all that suturing where shows us that there is someone definitely living there. It's not just a wee religious site that people are coming to and then going to their homes. Someone's actually staying there, and they're cooking, and they're living there. And the amount of ironwork and slag that we've got 
they're obviously making things there as well. And the ingot mold, which is obviously for bronze or precious metals, and I'm sure some of you saw me on the BBC News, all archaeologists want to find gold, my big smiling face, so the, inf the environment agency did not like that article, I can tell you that there. So <laughs> anyway, so, so th that's sort of what we know at the minute about this site. Now, the radiocarbon dates are a really great thing, because when you've got the radiocarbon dates, you can then start to look what you know about the history and how the site fits into the history. So we know roughly about 400 AD is whenever Christianity came to Ireland. And our radiocarbon dates are sitting, you know, nicely sort of around that period. Now, now even in my research that I've done, I've got this map and this shows Ireland at the start of the early medieval period. So and one of the references I found, sometime between AD 331 and 450, I apologize for any Irish speakers here, I'm going to say this completely wrong, the Battle of Akkad Lethderg, is that correct, Mario? You come up here and say it, say it into the mic, come on. What is it? Akkad Lethderg. Yep, that one there. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> the last Ulid king, so, Ulster, before this here, is a confederation of tribes basically in the north of Ireland. It's in sort of proto-history. It's sort of Ulster, the Ulster's mentioned in the north of Ireland. It's a different conglomeration of tribes. But round about this date, at that battle, that I, I can't say again, the last Ulster king of, from Emin Maha, Fergus Faha, is slain. And the Ulster, they're, they're defeated down here at the battle. The battle's somewhere down around here. Uh, the Ulster men are driven eastward. And the victors, the three colours, as they're called in later sources, established the Confederate Kingdom of the Argelia here. And then, short time after that, the O'Neills push in up in the northwestern Ulster, and they basically make the Argelia subservient. The Argelia translates as the hostage givers. The Iliad is now basically recorded as a confederation of tribes on the eastern side with the Uyanakuba down here in the modern sort of barony of Iva, the Dalfaita up here around Strangford Lock and Downpatrick, the Dalar Drani and the Dalriata, I've said that wrong as well, I imagine, but. Um, and in the, in the years after, there's many uh, sort of references in the annals of Ulster of conflict between all of these people and there's battles and it's, after the Ullet is pushed, pushed east, the, one of the ref suggestions is the Danes cast is built down here and the ban is the sort of border between the two. And our site just sits about here, so it does, and Navin is over here. So based on the radiocarbonates, you could suggest, we could suggest that this is maybe, um, our site is something with the Ulster maybe being pushed east and it's, it's something to do with that there. Potentially, as David would say, potentially. So, um, yeah, so it could be something to do with that. Then we know it's inhabited for at least a couple of centuries because our radiocarbon dates down here go up in the 656. Uh, the Battle of Magroth, which is Jim was always telling me about, Jim Conway, the Battle of Moira, which takes place only um, a mile away, really, from our site. So it's not, you know, you're thinking about the people and you're going, were the people who were living at the site, were they aware of the battle? Did they take part in it? It's fun, it's fun to speculate, so it is so. Um, and then, obviously, as you sort of move on in the early medieval period, we've got our Sutrium ware, which comes in, in the seventh century. That's right at the top of the ditch. Um, so we know the site's still inhabited then, and it could be inhabited even longer into the 12th century, but in 759, the first Viking raid in Ireland is recorded with the burning of Riku, by, uh, which is Rathlin Island, by heathens, which is, which is the Vikings. And then in 832, you know, you've got the Vikings raiding Armagh three times in one month. What was left on the last time, I don't know, but what this, this steal. Um, and then you've got the, 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 the Vikings using Loch Ness to raid. So if our site, which is just here, it's, it probably hasn't gone unnoticed to be honest, um, if, it, if it's still functioning by that period. So, I want to show you this wee site here. This is, this is a site that um, I found and um, work, worked on a bit um, with one of my 
colleagues. Uh, we found this about two years ago, and it's in an enclosure at White Rocks, White Rock Bay in Kalinchi. Now, I just wanted to put this up. This is what Fanula's field would look like if I let me strip it all out. So, <laughs> so you can see here, this is a ditch just coming right round. Just there. It hasn't been dug out yet. It's a pre axe photo. But what's interesting is, you see this black spread here and this black spread here? This is a big Bronze Age burnt mound. And when we, although we find lots of early Christian stuff dating to that, we find lots of flint scatters and lots of Bronze Age material all around. So you could find that there's a burnt mound somewhere in Fanula's field as well, something prehistoric. There's also Mesolithic flints down here and Neolithic pits. I like the saying, very fond of saying, good ground is good ground. Where people live now is where people lived in the past. And if it's a good ground and it's dry and it's well drained, you know, and, and even if it's defendable as well, um, pe people, people will, will live there and they'll keep coming back and using the same sites. That's the site there, all kind of dug out. We've just we've dug the ditch out around. It's been, it was slightly disturbed by a later drain. And that's the archaeologists in it, digging it out. And I know you're all looking at that photo going, who would become a commercial archaeologist? Look at them conditions. <laughs> but this site is similar because it's sitting, you can see this, the scale of the archaeologists in it. And there, you can imagine there would be a wee bit more topsoil on there. So it's about a meter, meter 20 deep. And that's very similar to this ditch that we got here. So... The similarities are similar. Going round as we dug it out, we found lots of sutra and more pottery, which is what we have. This is a little cup that was found on the site, and that's a, a reconstruction that was done of the cup. They also, at that site, had subsoil cut features. You know, Katie was talking about the little gully and trench, uh, 13, I think it was. You know, that could be what it's like coming around. And there's a little rectangular building, so there we have a little... We have a simple post hole. If we expand it out, we might find actually the whole building looking like that. As we're digging it out as well at this site, we found lots of iron slag and bits of vitrified ceramics um, from the kilns. So again, the, the similarities are there. And also at the site, this is, I'd like to put this in, this is a little insular enamel Irish buckle. There's only 15 of these have ever been found in the British Isles. So you never know, if we go back next year, we might find something as good, something as nice. It's nice to find all these things. Um, so really, where do we go from here? So some of you might know, um, the Ulster, we contacted the Ulster Archaeological Society because they have this fancy geophysics equipment and we told them all about the site. And um, Katie talked about it at the, at the conference last year to, to tickle their fancy and they, they certainly were. And they said, we'd like to come down, and they geophys the field. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got the results yet. We were hoping, we were kind of pushing them and going, we're doing this talk, can you give us the results? They haven't got them, but we do, we do have something else to show you as well. So they did electrical resistivity. So this is where they shoot an electrical pulse into the ground. So any of the ditches that you see that are holding moisture, it sends a signal back up, and you should hopefully be able to trace the line of them. And they did magnetometry. So whoever's doing the magnetometry can't have any metal on them. Everything, everything has to be plastic. And this picks up magnetic anomalies in the ground. So any like, big chunks of stone and stuff like that there, any, any really intense burning from kilns, this magnetometry should show it up. So we are waiting for this. And whenever we do get the results, we'll, uh, we'll post them on the, the Facebook groups so everybody can see. Now, one thing that they did do when they were down there was was a drone survey by a gentleman, David Craig, from Heritage NI, it was very kind enough to fly his drone. And he flew it over our field to kill McCollum Oak. And what you can just see there is the outline of our enclosure coming right round. And I'm just going to zoom in. There's a coming right round. And it's quite nice, because it comes round there, and there's a little step just there. And as you can see, that's our trenches from this season. We've been digging in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> Al Ruffle, when he did his survey initially, he's picked up, there was a bit of an L he picked up, and it's this, it's this kink, that's what he found. So we've been focusing all our attention down here. All these stones that we found in this trench that you cleaned around are probably from an internal bank or face that's somewhere around there that's collapsed in, into the ditch and just spread out. 
across the field. This trench here is our trench seven, where we also have our ditch. So I actually think there's a ditch coming around here, but there's probably a little inner sanctum, like that there. And then you'll have, I'll show you a reconstruction image in a minute. That's, sorry, do you see there, that's our trench from, trench four from season one, where we thought we found a suit drain, and it's not. It's the ditch running right round, and that's the ditch filled in, it's filled in with stone, so it is. So it's pretty cool. That's why we always say potential, because we said it was a potential suit drain, and then now we're wrong. So. But we'll find out what it is. We also, they also did this here. This here's showing the sort of level of the land. So the blue is where it's all very low lying and would have been quite wet. So you can see our site here actually just sits on this little dry patch in here. So you can imagine whoever's living in there it is for defense. Because you remember that bit down at the lower down, it's all boggy down here. It just would have been wet right round with a little causeway coming over. And that's kind of what I think this would have looked like. So you've got our inner ditch that we've found, and then our big outer ditch, you see that's full of all the stone. And there's probably little, the little sort of um, uh, gullies and stuff are gullies from houses, and our post holes from little structures inside. Uh, I think we've been digging just down here. So they, and I think it would be great to go back next year to move more into the middle and have a look and see if we can find any central sort of structure to confirm. I think it is possibly an ecclesiastical site. That's my, my sort of thought. But as you say, that's all the fun. It was all about the volunteers, so it was, and everybody coming down and having fun and digging and getting hands on. And I've kind of done a Louis Walsh here and assembled a, a boy band. So I have, so it would appear. <laughs> this is my particular favorite pose, I think, out of all of them. So it is uh, blue steel. So um, Katie took all the photos and she made everybody pose in exactly the same way. <laughs> so she did. So <laughs> um, yeah, but no, it was all about you. And like we were down there for three weeks and everybody had a really fantastic time. All the happy smiley faces, despite all the rain that we had some of the days. Um, it was really, really great. And to get the school groups involved and the, and, and the, the young ones from People First and all, and it, it, was, it was really, really great. So mm. really, that, that takes us up to where we are at the minute, and we'll maybe have a bit of a chat now and have some questions and stuff. So, um, and yeah, real thanks to David for organizing it all, and Fanula, and, and for everybody really, really involved. So. Thank you, guys. Ecclesiastical site, it's yeah. possible? Yeah. OK, great. Fingers crossed. <laughs> We're hoping. That's, cool. that's, cool. that's, cool. that's my theory. Uh, no, well, thank you. Potential. Um, is it potential? Potential. Potential. <laughs> potential ecclesiastical site. No, well, thank you very much. That was uh, really good, summarized fantastically. And I just want to say thank you as well for the way you run the site. Um, I mean, during those three weeks, and it was the same uh, 20, uh, the, 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 for the first dig, there was a really good atmosphere. It was just a really enjoyable site, and a lot of that comes down to the way he's, he's run it and the way he's welcomed uh, people you. in. Thank there was you. never a, there was never such a thing as a wrong question. No. The way you explain no. things, um, and I think a large part of success is down to yourself and uh, Katie, uh, Mario, Marez, I know uh, Johnny and uh, Stephen uh, also uh, dropped in. Ross, I think, dropped in as well. So thank you so much to the Northern Archaeological Consultancy team for organising this, and we'll give them a big hand here. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>
but he had a fantastic time when he, when he came out to visit and enjoyed speaking to everybody so much and he wanted to let me know how much he values all the contributions and he mentioned David in particular, great lad, first class, because he has put this all together. <laughs> And you do get, a, oh, I, Noah, the wee lad who found the blue bead, service and mention, good job. Zachary was the guy who found that big ingot mold. <laughs> <laughs> He's an archaeology student now. No. <laughs> so that's brilliant. I think Michael is too, are you? Good lad. Yes, great, great folk all together. Um, people do ask you when you start to talk about this, have you found any gold yet? Still not shirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, to me, the archaeological gold is all you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Fenella. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.